Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Flo, and, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tim, and I'm with Matt and Sachin, uh, and we're from BT. And today we're going to talk about how H3 saved our lives, um, which is probably an exaggeration. But, um, but hopefully in the next 15 minutes or so, you'll see that um, how we're using H3 uh, really helps us, and, and it's really rather good for speeding up kind of processing with all of our mobility data. Um, so we're uh, active intelligence, uh, and we uh, work with the EE mobile phone data. Um, it's aggregated, anonymized, extrapolated, and we try and produce uh, kind of location insights to understand 24-7 population patterns. So as you might imagine, this feeds into uh, things like origin destination matrices. We try and um, uh, figure out where people go, how do they go, what mode of transport, and, and even down to what train somebody goes on to. Um, uh, we also do things like footfall um, and, you know, try to understand how many people go to a place and what type of people they are. Where, over the last year or so, we've been working with a new generation of um, uh, kind of mobile phone data, so it's not CDR-based, it's uh, geolocated, so it's triangulated based on lots and lots of measurements from uh, cell towers. And um, this is really exciting for us because it kind of opens up a whole load of new possibilities to do, do a lot more with kind of uh, mobile phone data that, um, and gets us somewhere more towards kind of GPS. Um, so we're kind, of, we're kind of in between traditional CDR data and, and GPS. This is what, uh, this is a journey that I did. This is what it looks like. So uh, this is a journey from Southwest London to Chesterfield, which I made in February. And... Uh, these, this is what I kind of got on CDR records, 53 records, um, and you can see that we've got all of the kind of um, uh, the problem of spatial interpolation where we don't really know where somebody is, we just know where the cell tower covers. Some of them are really small because there's a nice dense signal network. Others uh, are really, really kind of quite big. Um, in the middle, we've got our new kind of GeoMND data, and uh, instead of being kind of points about cell towers, we've actually got geolocated points, which is great, but it opens up a whole kind of different way of doing things. Um, and on the right, um, uh, GPS data, uh, lots and lots of re more records, obviously it's much more accurate, but we've got also this kind of issue where uh, sometimes we don't know where, uh, that we, we miss data. So I was recording this journey with a GPS logger, and uh, between Leicester and Derby, I've got no data. I don't know why. Um, so with kind of lots and lots of, well, you know, eight times more data than CDR data, um, we need to kind of come up with some new ways of doing things. Um, and we kind of, we, we've landed on H3 um, purely because there's lots and lots of data. Um, so we've got kind of three to five billion points a day. We've got an amazing location processing engine that kind of transforms that into where people kind of dwell uh, and then the, calculates the journeys between those locations. So we end up with kind of 30 to 50 million journeys per day, something like that. But of course, none of that really makes that much sense until we join it to other geographies. So, you know, if you think about um, origin and destination data, you want to know what census geographies somebody went between um, rather than just two points on the map. Uh, because otherwise, otherwise we've got no way of reporting on it. Uh, likewise with footfall, you need to you want to know how many people are in the town centre. Um, now, these types of kind of operations um, make lots of sense um, as geographers. You know, we we're, we're used to using spatial SQL, um, but sometimes the scale of the data, as you see, uh, is a little bit too much. So here's here's a really simple example. Um, when we're doing origin destination matrices, we want to know what census geographies a journey starts in and it ends in. Um, we could do it one of two ways. We could do a spatial join. Um, and a BigQuery is pretty efficient. It's pretty effective. This is a, an example for a week of data. Uh, took two minutes uh, and 44 seconds. Most of that was in the spatial join because we're, kind of, we're doing 480 million uh, kind of uh, spatial operations. In contrast, with H3, we're, we're kind of using a pre-populated H3 census geography lookup. Uh, and instead of uh, 2 minutes 44, we're kind of a minute and a half. Um, it probably doesn't matter for a week of data, but when we're processing a scale for months and months in, at, uh, at once, this is where we start to see the big performance increases. And, and um, we often run into kind of, uh, if we're just using spatial SQL, we might run into memory issues. Um, Satin's going to uh, talk a little bit more about some of the challenges of, uh, of doing this at a massive scale. 
Thanks, Tim, for highlighting uh, the challenges on a day-to-day -day operations. What increases this challenge by multiple folds is our aim to build generic reusable solutions and to process uh, historical data at once. So in this slide of the next few slides, uh, we're going to show you how we demonstrate, how we leverage the power of history to build scalable solutions. So the picture on the left is a simple three geometries for which we need to build location insights. So the core to any location insights is to identify the raw anonymized pings uh, that are relevant to the area of interest. In order to obtain that, uh, all we need is to perform a spatial join between the geometries of the user geographies and the geometries of the anonymized pings. Simple. And it also works well. If there are multiple geometries, you just need to do a spatial cross join. And thanks to BigQuery's geospatial capabilities, it works well to some extent. However, we anticipate that we need to do a location insights over 2.3 million square miles of area. Uh, that is roughly uh, 25 times the whole of UK. And when we consider our historical data, which adds another dimension to the challenge, we have more than a trillion anonymized geometries to consider. This is where we have problem with this approach. It doesn't scale well. So what do we do? Enter H3. So we use H3 as an intermediate spatial processing unit, wherein uh, we transform all the client shapes, irrespective of its shape and form, into a H3 index. This brings uniformity to our approach. And then we transform all the anonymized pings also into H3. So now we have client shapes in H3 and anonymized pings also in H3. So now in order to obtain the raw anonymized pings for any point of interest or any area of interest is all we need to do is a textual equijoin instead of a spatial cross join, which was in the previous slide. So this has given us a drastic improvement in our performance. And since uniformity is inherent in this approach, there is a reduction in the effort as well because we can build a lot of reusable pipelines which can be used between different data products. And there is obvious reduction in the cost as well uh, moving to this approach. This slide is all about building faster insights. Uh, here we are exploring an approach with H3 uh, to build location insights on the fly. This is tailor-made for visualization platform use cases. When we think of location insights and visualization platform, uh, we consider uh, loading pre-generated aggregated insights for certain shapes to a fast BI engine and then rendering it through a UI. However, this approach has a uh, problem of the flexibility. We cannot, shape, uh, we cannot check any shapes that we want on a map. So what we are planning or exploring here is uh, we divide the whole of UK into H3 of level 12 and then build rich aggregated insights at this small spatial area. Once we have this, the user, whenever he selects a point of interest or any location of interest, uh, we identify the H3 indices that are relevant to this UI and then we build the final reports from this aggregated insights rather than from the raw anonymized data. Since we are going from an already aggregated insights, uh, this is drastically faster and suits well within the response time of the UI. Uh, for this, obviously, we have to make some adjustments to our uh, data pipelines and the data architecture. We have a purpose-built schema uh, to store this H3 aggregated insights. Uh, we also make use of some H3 optimizations, like making use of k-rings instead of a traditional circular buffer to build a buffer around the PUI. Uh, one issue which we are still looking at better ways of solving is when we aggregate from a smaller spatial area to a larger spatial area, we end up with multiple counts for certain entities, which we call as a unicity challenge, which we are still looking at ways to uh, solve it better. I now hand over to Matt to talk more about history. Cool. Um, yeah, so thanks, Sachin. Um, so I'm going to talk about another area where we're starting to use um, H3 in some of our analytics. This is still kind of more of a work in progress. So um, these are our kind of current thoughts, but it will kind of probably evolve in the next few um, weeks and it's still um, being thought about. But yeah, so what one part of our, in our um, kind of analytics and pre-processing, we're often interested in kind of comparing trajectories of users. So that might be the kind of the CDR cell tower pings for a user in a particular day or the geolocated pings. And we ought to kind of compare users um, for various different reasons. We might want to kind of identify kind of similar users to identify clusters in the user base, or look at kind of repeated patterns in what particular user's behavior to identify their kind of typical habits. There's also some applications of this in kind of missing data imputation because real world data is always messy and you often, you might have gaps to fill. And then kind of also understanding a little bit about the relationship between this kind of new geolocated data and our historical CDR data. Um, so the way this is kind of working right now is it's kind of fairly standard ML pipeline-based approach where we're taking the pings, 
taking our object, which, I mean, in ML could be a kind of a sentence or an image, but in this case is kind of user trajectories. We turn that into a feature vector somehow. I'm doing it in a pretty simple way right now, but I mean, there's like tons of ways that you kind of can improve the feature engineering in ML. And then what we're doing is kind of looking at um, these feature vectors and using them to kind of look up the most um, similar days um, within the kind of data set that we've got for particular users. Um, now, the challenge with this is when we've got really large scale data, if we try and do this naively, we're comparing like loads of objects with loads of other objects and we kind of get kind of N squared entries roughly in what um, the cross join we're doing and we'll just kind of crash everything. Um, and so, well, there are kind of fancy, near, kind of clever nearest neighbor algorithms such as KD trees and kind of just standard K and N which are implemented in Python, but we're having a go at doing a lot of our work in BigQuery SQL in Active Intelligence. So I've been kind of thinking about ways to kind of improve this without having to rely on something else. Um, and I'll skip through this because we're running out of time, but basically, Hey, filter on H3, that's it. Um, and yeah, so I've done a few, um, some kind of experiments with a bit of sample data, looking into if I pre-filter the uh, trajectories I'm comparing at to start within the same H3, um, which is a bit of an approximation. It won't give you necessarily the exact nearest neighbor, but will give you some reasonably good. Looking at kind of how the time taken um, kind of varies with kind of different H3 resolutions and also the level of the distortion in the nearest neighbors that you get. And I found that as you expect, um, if you try really high, like large size or high resolution, no, or kind of a cross join or a really big H3, everything crashes or it takes ages. But as you go kind of down, you can do this pretty quickly. It's still an approximation, so there's a bit of a distortion in terms of the nearest neighbor distance. But in practice, that doesn't always matter for some of the applications. So we're kind of just kind of going to think about that trade off a bit when we come to use this in practice. So, um, yes, th thanks very much. And if, yeah, if you've got any comments, questions, come talk to us. Thank you, guys. Any questions in the audience? I've been told to make sure I look up. It's more difficult with the lights. Uh, if you could put your hand up if you have any questions. Up there? Oh, there we go. So I didn't see that one. Uh, hello. Is it on? Um, if you were able to actually, oh, how much value would you get if you were able to uh, go around the H3 usage? Like if you were able to do these, uh, like draw a polygon and do the analysis on long, long lats directly? So uh, you mean like what is the response time? Uh, from the map to the insights. Um, well, it seems like there's quite a lot of work that goes into yeah. so doing so the H3 kind of stuff. Exploring in this approach. Uh, so what we aim for is we want to get it around a few seconds of response time for the UK area. Uh, right now, we are not there yet, but yeah, we are looking at ways to get to there. Uh, it all depends on the data architectures that we use and how we connect the different stages because every sub-second matters. So we're still working on that. Any other questions? Is everybody eager for a coffee? I think everybody's eager for a coffee. Okay, well, I think you guys are around all day, so if anybody wants to catch up in the breaks, feel free to. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.